Welcome to our continuing series, Fine Poetry, Poems That Touch Deeper Chords. Today, Poems of Rainer Maria Rilke, Part 4. The Sonnets to Orpheus 4. O oh, you tender ones, walk now and then into the breath that blows coldly past. Upon your cheeks let it tremble and part. Behind you it will tremble together again. O oh, you blessed ones, you who are whole, you who seem the beginning of hearts, bows for the arrows, and arrows targets, tear bright, your lips more eternally smile. Okay. Don't be afraid to suffer. Return that heaviness to the earth's own weight. Heavy are the mountains, heavy the seas. Even the small trees you planted as children have long since become too heavy. You could not carry them now. But the winds, but the spaces. Translated by Stephen Mitchell. The Swan. This laboring of ours with all that remains undone, as if still bound to it, is like the lumbering gait of the swan. And then our dying, releasing ourselves from the very ground on which we stood, is like the way he hesitantly lowers himself into the water. It gently receives him, and, gladly yielding, flows back beneath him as wave follows wave. While he, now wholly serene and sure, with regal composure, allows himself to glide. Translation by Joanna Macy and Anita Barrows. The Sonnets to Orpheus, 19. Though the world keeps changing its form as fast as a cloud, still what is accomplished falls home to the primeval. Over the change and the passing, larger and freer, soars your eternal song, God with the lyre. Never has grief been possessed, never has love been learned. And what removes us in death is not revealed. Only the song through the land hallows and heals. Translated by Stephen Mitchell. The weight. It is life in slow motion. It's the heart in reverse. It's a hope and a half. Too much and too little at once. It's a train that suddenly stops with no station around, and we can hear the cricket, and leaning out the carriage door, we vainly contemplate a wind we feel that stirs the blooming meadows, the meadows made imaginary by this stop. 
translated by A. Poulon. The Unicorn The saintly hermit, midway through his prayers, stopped suddenly and raised his eyes to witness the unbelievable. For there, before him, stood the legendary creature, startling white, that had approached soundlessly, pleading with his eyes. The legs so delicately shaped, balanced a body wrought of finest ivory. And as he moved, his coat shone like reflected moonlight. High on his forehead rose the magic horn, the sign of his uniqueness, a tower held upright by his alert, yet gentle, timid gait. The mouth of softest tints of rose and gray, when opened slightly, revealed his gleaming teeth, whiter than snow. The nostrils quivered faintly. He sought to quench his thirst, to rest and find repose. His eyes looked far beyond the saint's enclosure, reflecting vistas and events long vanished, and closed the circle of this ancient mystic legend. The Voices The rich and fortunate do well to keep silent, for no one cares to know who and what they are, but those in need must reveal themselves, must say, I am blind, or I'm on the verge of going blind, or Nothing goes well with me on earth, or I have a sickly child, or I have little to hold me together. And chances are this is not nearly enough. And because people try to ignore them as they pass by them, these unfortunate ones have to sing. And at times, one hears some excellent singing. Of course, people differ in their tastes. Some would prefer to listen to choirs of boy castrati. But God himself comes often and stays long when the castrati singing disturbs him. Translated by Albert Ernest Fleming. The Sonnets to Orpheus One. A tree ascended there. O oh, pure transcendence. O oh, Orpheus sings. O oh, tall tree in the ear. And all things hushed. Yet even in that silence, a new beginning, beckoning, change appeared. Creatures of stillness crowded from the bright, unbound forest, out of their lairs and nests. And it was not from any dullness, not from fear, that they were so quiet in themselves, but from just listening. Bellow, roar, shriek seemed small inside their hearts. And where there had been, at most, a makeshift hut to receive the music, a shelter nailed up out of their darkest longing, with an entryway that shuddered in the wind, you built a temple deep inside their hearing. Translated by Stephen Mitchell. 
The Sonnets to Orpheus, Book 2, 23. Call to me, to the one among your moments that stands against you, ineluctably, intimate as a dog's imploring glance, but again, forever, turned away when you think you've captured it at last. What seems so far from you is most your own. We are already free. And we're dismissed where we thought we would soon be at home. Anxious, we keep longing for a foothold. We, at times too young for what is old, and too old for what has never been. Doing justice only where we praise, because we are the branch, the iron blade, and sweet danger ripening from within. Translated by Stephen Mitchell. The Sonnets to Orpheus, Book 2, 6. Rose, you majesty once, to the ancients, you were just a calyx with the simplest of rims. But for us, you are the full, the numberless flower, the inexhaustible countenance. In your wealth you seem to be wearing gown upon gown, upon a body of nothing but light. Yet each separate petal is, at the same time, the negation of all clothing and the refusal of it. Your fragrance has been calling its sweetest names in our direction for hundreds of years. Suddenly, it hangs in the air like fame. Even so, we have never known what to call it. We guess. And memory is filled with it unawares, which we prayed for from hours that belong to us. Translated by Stephen Mitchell. The Sonnets to Orpheus, Book 2, 1. Breathing, you invisible poem, complete interchange of our own essence with world space, you counterweight in which I rhythmically happen. Single wave motion, whose gradual sea I am. You, most inclusive of all our possible sea space, has grown warm. How many regions in space have already been inside me? There are winds that seem like my wandering sun. Do you recognize me, air? full of places I once absorbed. You, who were the smooth bark, roundness, and leaf of my words. Translated by Stephen Mitchell.